Take your notebook and uh, turn there. Last week we looked um, at uh, Mormonism, and this week we come to Catholicism. You remember with me that we've said that this is a study that's looking at the real thing versus the counterfeit things. Um, let's go and let's click on here to the next one. Notice this. We look, first of all, at the true gospel. If, yes, if you don't have any notes, please lift your hand. These guys have notes for you. They, they have them ready. Notice this with me, the true gospel. The true gospel has these gospel threads in it. We need to remember the real thing if we're going to be able to identify the wrong thing. And let's look at these. I want you to get them. The character of God, that he's holy, just, and loving, that he is righteous in all of his ways. Number two, what's the number two? We've got to remember that the, the, the huge problem is our sin, and this is where all the cancer and the car wrecks and all the pain and all of the troubles comes from all the broken relationships. This is because we are sinners in need of, number three, a sufficient Savior. And the one who is the sufficient Savior is God himself, the perfect sacrifice. Christ born into the flesh and brought to us in order to pay the sin debt that we could not pay. And then the number four is, and we're going to see this tonight, very important, the necessity of what? Faith. Faith. Not the necessity of works, but the necessity of faith. And faith in what? Faith, say it again, faith in Christ. Christ alone. He's where my hope is. He is what I'm believing in. He is what I'm trusting in. If I'm going to get to God, it's going to be because Christ came and died on the cross for our sins. So this is the gospel, gospel thread. The urgency of this is eternity is coming. It's not a joke. This is for real. And so we, we see that we need to know the gospel and we need to know about the counterfeit gospels and the false gospels that are around us so that we can speak words of life. That's what God has called us to do. Look at the next part here, the one true God. And the big point of the one true God before you, don't, don't go to it, What's the big point of the one true God that we are emphasizing during Secret Church? Okay, somebody said three in one, otherwise known as? The, very good, the Trinity. To the Trinity, this is a big deal. Christians need to understand that this is the essence of who God is. And out of the Trinity, the three in one, out of the Trinity comes our salvation. Christ coming to the earth to die on the cross for our sins, God saving man with himself, God becoming man, um, true God of true God, uh, and true man of true God coming to pay for our sins. So notice this here with me. Go on to the next one, guys. Um, the truth is God in three persons, each person is fully God, and there is what? One God, one God not three gods. But each one is fully God. Jesus, Jesus, when he was born, did not come into existence. He was in existence before the foundation of the world. In fact, he has always been in existence. Jesus, the, the uh, second person of the Trinity, um, the, the Son, permanently, continually emanating from the Father, is this beautiful picture. Now, there's some things there that are hard to understand. How can he be three in one? And, and how can he be... Permanently, continually, eternally emanating from the Father. He always is being beget from the Father. This is the way he is constantly coming from him. Um, there, there's all kinds of things for us to think about there. But um, the big picture is this is clear of what the Scripture has said. Jesus is God. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. So there's no, there's no ambiguity about that. Um, it's just a, the picture. So we've come up with the word Trinity as humans um, and as, as uh, people who study the Bible for us to understand three in one. Okay, very quickly, keep on going there. We're talking about cults and counter, counterfeit gospels. So those two things, either cult and counterfeit gospel, not all counterfeit gospels are necessarily a cult. And but we would say that all cults are a counterfeit gospel. So there's, there's the possibility of something being co considered a cult. And then there are other characteristics that you would say, well, it's not a cult, but it is a false belief. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at tonight a little bit. Cults are groups which claim to be in harmony with Christianity, but deny foundational Christian doctrines. Look at the next one. So... They, are generally, they generally follow one individual who dictates false teaching. And so, in a way, as we look at this and as we start to look at Catholicism in depth, we can start to say, well, wait a minute, both of these things 
are true of that, so we want to we wanna look at that. Now, some people might say, what is a counterfeit gospel? A counterfeit gospel is a fraudulent imitation of the gospel that deceives. And so we want to be real careful about that. Now, I like our study of Catholicism, Catholicism because it, it's, it's kind of, um, it's very important that Christians take a moment and look at Catholicism. And, it, and it's because we have many, many Catholics that are all around us. And some of you would say, I come from a Roman Catholic background. Um, I was raised as a Catholic. I was baptized as an infant as a Catholic. Or family members were. Or you have other family members that are, are Catholics. And so there are some folks who would say, well, is it, is it even good for us to call out some of these things and call out some of these names? And we said at the beginning, even in the first week that we were here, it is right that we look carefully at beliefs because beliefs can either save you or condemn you. And the gospel is not, this isn't a joke. There's eternal urgency here. And Jesus is very clear about what the truth is. And so we want to be careful to be people who are paying very careful attention to what we say we believe and what the word actually says. So look at page 65 with me. Who are Catholics? General definition of Catholics. The faith, practice, and system of government of the Roman Catholic Church, of which the fill it in, Pope or the Bishop of Rome is the head. And so this, this is a very, very big foundational issue to Catholicism, that there is a Pope who is the foundational head. We're going to see how much they believe that. Look at the next bullet point here. Claims to or originate with Christianity and to carry on a line of successive Popes, beginning with St. Peter, who govern the church with authority. And really, we're going to put above that word, total authority. Um, it's important for you to recognize that. And you say, really? Let's see what, that, what they really believe about that. We're going to look and we're going to see that. The, how big is Catholicism? From 1910 to 2010, how long a period of time is that? A hundred years, so this hundred year population, the Catholic population grew from 291 million to nearly 1.1 billion people over the last hundred years. You say, well, wait a minute, I thought the Catholic Church is in decline. And I would say to you, in some areas of the, Catholic, some of the, areas of the world, the Catholic Church is in decline. In some other areas of the world, the Catholic Church is growing. And that's, we see this expansion and reduction that happens depending on where you are in the world. Um, but in, even in the last few decades, there has been a real reduction of Catholicism in Europe and in North America. But nevertheless, notice this. They have steadily comprised approximately half of the global Christian population and approximately 16% of the entire global population. So 16% of the world is, um, the, the idea is a Roman Catholic. So look at the next part here. Geographic migration. They've been moving around in the world. 1910, notice these are 1910 versus 2010, three times. So 1910, 65% of Catholics lived in Europe and 24% lived in Latin America. Now, in 2010, 24% of Catholics live in Europe. Do you see that? Massive change. So Europe is far less Catholic than it used to be. 39% in Latin America and the Caribbean. Look at 1910. Approximately 1 million Catholics, less than 1% of global population, Catholic population, lived in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's anywhere below the Sahara Desert, only 1%. Now look at it. 171 million Catholics live in in sub-Saharan um, Africa. So a huge expansion um, that is there. Look at the bottom one. 1910, approximately 15 million or 5% in North America. Um, in 2010, approximately 89 million or 8% in North America altogether. So some major changes in that. Now, we need to spend a few minutes here looking at what does Catholicism teach? And um, it's interesting that Catholicism is a very, very philosophical and very, very much of a theologically oriented belief system. It's not like beliefs don't really matter to them. If you really look at it and if you look at the priesthood, the priesthood tends to be extremely educated. They tend to be extremely prepared. It's not like um, in many Protestant uh, circles, there might be a far lower level of education among pastors and among teachers. But with Catholics, as far as the 
priesthood goes, as far as their leadership goes, they tend to be very, very educated. The problem is, what are they taught? And that's what we're going to look at here very carefully, very gently. We want to see what they believe and what, how, it differs, how it differs from um, the Christian faith. But let's start with the similarities. There are some major similarities of Catholics to, to Bible-believing or what we would call Protestant evangelicalism. We'll use that term tonight. Protestant evangelicalism, which would, would, which would recognize the truth of the Reformation, breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church, going back to what? Going back to what the Scripture says and what the Scripture teaches, we've studied that several years in the life of our church. Every October, we look at the Protestant Reformation. This is where the protests begin. They protested the, the beliefs of the Catholic Church, and they thought they were going to reform the church, the Reformation, but it didn't turn out to be a reform. It turned out to be a what? A breakaway. It, it completely broke away, and that's where we see all of Protestantism that has actually broken away from the Roman Catholic Church. Um, few strands of it that have been outside the Catholic Church, but for the most part, um, had broke away. So let's see the major similarities of those that would we, we would call Bible-believing um, Christians. First of all is the Trinity. They agree with us on the Trinity. God is one. He is revealed in three persons. Now, right there at the top of page 66, you see a paragraph. It says, we do not confess three gods. Do you see that? We do not. Look at the bottom of that. It says, the catechism of the Catholic Church. That's the CCC. You're going to see CCC throughout the notes tonight. So this is the catechism. That's the idea. And then it has a reference number that is there. Um, and the CCC reference number is, it's like the section in which it deals with that theology. The catechism is a very large catechism, and um, it's, it's very involved. But notice here with me um, what it says. We do not confess three gods, but one God in three persons. And the, the substantial trinity, they are together in, in their substance. The divine persons do not share the one divinity among themselves, but each of them is God whole and entire. The Father is that which the Son is, that which the Father is, and the Son, Father and the Son is that which the Holy Spirit is, by one nature, God. We, for the most part, would agree that the, the Trinity represents three persons in one. We tend to, would, to agree with that. It's important to note the next bullet point there. Catholicism does not consider Mary as part of the Trinity. So they're not saying that Mary is, is part of God. Look at the next part. Concerning Jesus. We agree with them on a lot of things concerning Jesus. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. We would agree with that. He is fully divine and fully human. We agree with them on that, and their statement on that is correct. Look at the next one. Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, was buried, and resurrected from the dead. Great, we agree with that. So we're agreeing with who Christ is, second person of the Trinity. There are other things that we tend to agree with them on. We tend to agree with them on the sinfulness of humanity, that man by nature is sinful. We also would agree with them that necessity of salvation, you need to be saved, you need to be converted. That, that needs to happen. You need to be taken from a, state, a sinful state into a righteous state. And then, look at the bottom one here, numerous social issues. We agree with Catholics on many social issues. Can you name a few that at least officially, traditionally, we have agreed with and we've gone side by side with them on? What are some of them? <laughs> you guys are good. Abortion. What else? Marriage um, and biblical idea of marriage. Now, they are wavering on that right now. The Pope is seeing how much he, I mean, he's kind of dancing, right? You, you didn't think Pope's dance, but they do. Um, so he's, he's, he's pushing around on that. What, are there some other social issues that they would agree with? Okay, and we've kind of mentioned that a little bit. She's, Mrs. Um, Hewlett said homosexuality. I, I, I would say we're, we're classifying that with with. The issue of marriage and gender and all of that, they would tend to look at a very traditional biblical view of that, so we agree with that. How about the, like the issues of drugs? How about the issues of the importance of family? Um, the importance of, of being together as a family? We, we would say that many Catholic families were very familially 
oriented on things. And they, they would, we would agree with them very much on the importance of worship. Many Catholic churches traditionally would have said, hey, you need to go to church. You need to be at church. I mean, you need to, you need to worship together. You need to be in the body of Christ. They would talk a lot about that, and we would, we would tend to look at them, and we would say, well, there's a lot of things that they would say about that that we agree with. So it's, even some of those are not just social issues, but even ecclesiolog- ecclesiological issues that we would agree with, church issues that we would agree with. So there are, what about religious liberty? Um, Catholics tend to be very big on preserving religious liberty, the liberty to believe what you want to believe religiously. Not just to be Catholic, but to be Muslim or Jewish or, or Buddhist or whatever you want to do um, here in the United States and in other places of the world, Catholics tend to uh, agree with us on the fact that um, liberty is, and, and religious liberty is important. So we can, we can run side by side with them on many of those issues, and we have, and, and that's very good. What about some of the miscellaneous differences? And that's the next section here. And I want you to put a big circle around these words on scripture and authority, because this is a very big difference. And it's a very fundamental difference that you need to understand. This is where we start to really differ. Number one is this. In Catholicism, they believe in three, put the number three in there, three sources of authority. And the first source of the authority that they would say is the Bible, and we don't have it in the notes, but with the Apocrypha, so we wouldn't agree with the Apocrypha. Those are other books that are added um, at a later time, but they would say, we believe in the Bible. But the second one that you would see on page 67 is they would say, we believe in church tradition, right in church tradition. And so these Church, these are the traditions of the church. You say, well, if Baptists don't believe in church tradition, I don't know what they believe in. No, it's a different kind of tradition. We're not talking about when you take the offering or, you know, when you stand up and when you sit down and that kind of thing. We are talking about the beliefs of theological nature that come out of the traditions of the church. Look what the catechism says there underneath church tradition. As a result, the church to whom the transmission and interpretation of revelation is entrusted does not derive her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scripture alone. Do you read with that? It does not derive all of the truth from Holy Scripture alone. Both Scripture, and then look what it says... And tradition, this is the traditions of the church, must be accepted in honor, look what it says, underline it, with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. So this is saying the traditions of men are on par with this. And if you watch the Luther theater, Luther movie in here with us, you saw Luther go toe-to-toe with a cardinal over that very issue. He's saying, I'm sorry, but where the traditions of the church conflict with Scripture, the traditions of the church are wrong. And so that was that we saw that just kind of get unfolded in Luther's story, in Luther's life, as he was calling them out and saying, these traditions, they're not all correct. In fact, there's a bunch of them that are very, very anti-scriptural. What about the magisterium? What does that mean? The magisterium has to do with the teaching ministry of the church. So this is the third um, major authority that the church would say. The magisterium, this is important, this is huge. This is the ministry of the church and the authority of what? The pope. So what, notice this first statement that is here in CCC 85. Look what it says. In the cath- this is in the catechism. The task of giving an authentic interpre- interpretation of the word of God, whether in its written form or in the form of tradition, which we just read about, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the church alone. Its authority in this matter is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. This means that the task of interpretation has been entrusted to the bishops in communion with the successor of Peter, the bishop of Rome. Now, where are they going at? Look at the next one in 882. The Roman pontiff, or the pope, by reason of his office as vicar of Christ and as pastor of the entire church has, underline it, full, supreme, and universal power over the whole church, a power which he can always exercise unhindered. Now, I'd like for you, just so nobody's confused here, right below that, not true. (laughs) 
They want to make sure that somebody didn't read that and go, well, I guess with some of them I'm reading something wrong. I, I thought we don't believe that. I just want to remind you that we differ with them about this. We would say that this is incorrect. Look at the next paragraph. If then any say, if then any shall say that the Roman pontiff has the office merely of inspection or direction and not full and supreme power of jurisdiction over the universal church, not only in the things which belong to the faith and morals, but also in the things which relate to the discipline and government of the church spread throughout the world, or if they assert that he possesses merely the principal part and not all the fullness of this supreme power, or that power which he enjoys is not ordinary and immediate, both over each and all the churches and over all, each and all the pastors and the faithful, underline it, let him be anathema. That means let him be accursed. Let him be damned. This is the teaching of the Catholic Church, and this is right from Vatican I, and of the Catholic Church, which, from which no one can deviate without what? Are they serious about this? They're serious about this. Now, if you're a Christian and you're, and you're sitting and you're saying, well, I, I have a lot of friends that are Catholic. Well, so do I. I do too, and I'm not, we're, so we're not trying to be mean to Catholics, but I think as, as people of God, as Christians, we, should, we, should, we take seriously what we believe. We believe that this makes the difference between heaven and hell. This is either faith correct or faith in error, and so we must look at that. So as we, as we point these things out, we're not trying to be hostile, we're not trying to be mean. I, in this day and time, nobody wants to offend anybody. Nobody wants to say that anybody else is wrong. And friends, that's ungodly because there's truth and there's error and we need to be able to recognize the difference. Now, notice that circle Vatican I under that paragraph that I just read. But you say, what in the world Vatican I? There are councils that occur throughout, without, throughout Roman Catholic history and Vatican I, just put out there to the side, was 1869 and 1870. So this was a two-year, two, a little over a year and a half period of time where they gathered together, the cardinals and many priests and theologians, at St. Peter's Basilica. And there are pictures of it. You know, there was this massive um, meeting that went on for about a year and a half. And during that year and a half, they came out with some big statements. And I think I may have brought my Vatican II book, and I apparently didn't. Um, I had intended to bring my Vatican II book, which is a book about that big that comes from the 1950s. In 1959... Uh, the Pope declared another Vatican meeting. And so the Vatican meeting would come together, and it started in 1959, and it didn't end until 1965. And that's when Vatican II came out. That's when they went away from the all-Latin mass, and they, they would allow mass in other languages. There were many changes that were made during that time. And when that was established, that's what we're talking about, the magisterium. They're saying, this is from God. This, is, this new decision and these new orders are official and without error. Look at the bottom of page 67. It is clear, therefore, that the supremely wise arrangement of God, sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the magisterium of the church are so connected and associated with one of them that they cannot stand without the others. Working together, each in its own way, under the action of the Holy Spirit, they contribute effectively to the salvation of souls." Um, so they firmly believe um, this is um, from God in their beliefs. Notice the next part. What do we believe? So the, the next phrase here, evangelical Protestantism, just right above that, me, I, if that's you. Um, so that's us um, or SHBC. So what do, what do we believe? We would say when it comes to the authorities in the church, we believe in what? <laughs> Scripture alone. Scripture only. Scripture is what we believe, sola scriptura. And this was one of Luther and all of the, the uh, Protestant Reformation's point. Um, and you can see even in Revelation 20, in 2 Timothy, in Revelation 22, we've, we've spent a lot of time on that. But look at Revelation 22. This is at the end of your Bible. And look what it says. Apostle John is writing um, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the words of Christ, 
I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes them away from the, from the words of the, this book of the prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. The Bible is very clear saying, you're not to add or to take away from the word of God. But that's exactly what we start to see the Catholic Church does as it adds its authority. And when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, he is speaking infallibly um, to the church and to the world. Notice in the middle of page 68, what about the difference on Mary? We have a difference in how we view Mary. We do view Mary. We just don't view Mary the way that they view Mary. In fact, um, you can just put a big circle around Mary because there's a few of these that are coming up here. I want you to just kind of notice this. Catholicism says this. Catholicism says Mary is the holy mother of God. There's a lot of things that they may say about Mary, a lot of other names for Mary that they would have. But look what it says in uh, 975. It says, we believe that the holy, the holy mother of God, the new Eve, mother of the church, continues in heaven to exercise her maternal role on behalf of the members of Christ. And we would just simply say, there is no scriptural support for that whatsoever. That, that simply is not in the words of Jesus. That is not in the words of the apostles. That is, not in the, that is not in the practice of the early church. Mary was a wonderful, blessed woman that God used, but he also used the apostle Paul, and he also used a lot of other people as well. As well. We, don't pray that, we are not to pray to the apostle Paul. We are not to build buildings uh, in, in honor of the apostle Paul, just as we are not to do that from Mary. But look what they believe about Mary preserved from original sin. That means she was not sinful ever. Preserved from original sin and pure, fill that in, from all sin in her life. Notice what they believe on this. From among the descendants of Eve, God chose the Virgin Mary to be the mother of his son, full of grace. Mary is the most excellent fruit of redemption. From the first instant of her conception... She was totally preserved from the stain of original sin. And she remained pure from all personal sin throughout her life. There is nowhere in Scripture that that is what is said. Um, it does say, hail, O righteous one. It does recognize, favored one, excuse me, not righteous one, favored one. It does say that God had chosen her for a purpose, but it doesn't say that she was sinless. Notice the next here at the bottom on page 68. Devotion to Mary and saints in, is intrinsic to worship. They so believe in Mary that they say that Mary is a part of all of your worship as a person. Uh, the church's devotion to the Blessed Virgin is intrinsic to Christian worship. So she's in everything um, of the worship. Underline this. The church rightly honors the Blessed Virgin with special devotion. This is what they would say. From the most ancient times, the Blessed Virgin has been honored with the title of Mother of God, to, those, to whose protection the faithful fly in their dangers and needs. So they're saying, you need protection. Oh, you're in trouble. You need help. Pray to Mary. Fly to Mary. Fly to her in prayer is the idea. Quickly run to her in prayer. This very special devotion differs essentially from the adoration which is given to the incarnate word, that's to Jesus, and equally to the Father and the Holy Spirit, and greatly fosters this adoration. The liturgical feast dedicated to the mother of God and the Marian prayer, such as the rosary, are an, are an epitome of the whole gospel express this devotion to the Virgin Mary. Now, um, Many of you um, have seen here in America, and you've seen in other places, a lot of Catholic names for different things. And I think I have some pictures of some buildings that are here, Michael. Um, but notice here with me, um, some of you have been to Paris, and th they would have uh, Notre Dame is in Paris. How many of you have ever seen Notre Dame in Paris? Have you ever seen Notre Dame? It's a glorious building. It's an amazing building. Um, and go on to the next one that is here and come more. They're, they're you know, just tremendous, tremendous places. I remember that's all uh, Notre Dame just in Paris alone. Now, this is, go back, uh, back to the interior. There we go. This is Notre Dame in Lyon, Lyon, France. Um, you know, every major uh, area has a Notre Dame. 
What does Notre Dame mean? Notre Dame, say it out loud after I say it, Our Lady. That's what it means, Our Lady. Notre is ours, and Dame, or Dame, is Lady. So they would say, Our Lady. This is, this is the idea of Our Lady. This is the, the whole picture of Mary and all that she is. So every time you see a, a, a Catholic church that is named Notre Dame you, Dame, you need to understand this is a basilica erected to what, what comes to be, and they, they, would say, they would say, we don't like you to say that, but what comes to the worship of Mary. They're praying to Mary. They're hailing Mary. They are, they are saying that Mary is the is oh, favored one. They're praying to her for help. For help. They're looking to her for grace. Um, and they're praying to her for salvation. Even In fact, these things say that she contributes to salvation. Now, um, the previous pope, from the pope that we have right now, declared her a co-mediatrix with Christ. You've heard me talk about that before. That means a co-mediatrix. That means that she is a co-mediator between you and God. She is one like Jesus. She, with Jesus, is saving you from your sin. These buildings are built with ornate beauty um, in recognition of her. Now, I have to be honest with you, and, and I can't resist saying this, but Every time we would, we would, we, were, we lived in Europe. So we saw Notre Dame places all over the place. Um, we would, some, there were some colleagues that I had that they wouldn't ever go in them. They would say, I'm not going in there. Um, I, 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 I believe this is not good. I, I believe that this is a pagan temple. Um, this is not a, a Christian place. Um, this is to the worship of a, a sinful person that needed salvation just like anybody else. So I had a few colleagues that were, they, their conscience wouldn't let them go in, but um, I, I saw it as, um, okay, I've been in Buddhist temples, I've been in Muslim mosques, I've been in other places, I can go in here, I can look at the architecture, I can even appreciate the architecture and see that God's glory was given to man to build this stuff. I do not relate this to the worship of Mary, but we didn't call it Notre Dame, we called it Lure Dame. Lure means, some of you know what Lure means, Lure means their lady. So we said, this is their lady. So if you say that out loud in France, though, they'll go, oh, yeah, you go up to Lourdes and then you take a right, and it's after Lourdes. And they're like, our lady, their lady? You're saying their lady? Yeah, it's not my lady. So um, I only got one lady. She's right back over there. She's in Brazil. Um, so, but look in the middle of page 69. Protestant evangelicalism would say this about Mary. We say, we say Mary is honored as a godly woman, who bore the Son of God incarnate. And this was a, a great privilege for her um, to do that, and we love her um, in that regard. That this, There was a very special relationship in that, but there was absolutely zero indication that we would ever pray to her, that we would ever look to her, that we would ever worship her, that we would ever esteem her beyond the earthly uh, vessel that God would use to bring uh, Christ into the world. Look at the bottom of page 69. Circle the words on sin. This is another big area. So on Mary, how do, we, how do we differ from them? Let's look at how we differ from them on sin. Catholicism says there are two types of sin. There are mortal sins, which destroys the saving grace of God, and there are venial sins that does not destroy the saving grace of God. And so notice here at the bottom, mortal sin destroys charity in the heart of of man by a grave violation of God's law. It turns away, uh, it turns man away from God, who is his ultimate end and his beatitude, by preferring an inferior good to him. Venial sin allows charity to subsist. That means it allows the love of God and righteousness of God to continue to stay, even though it offends and wounds it. So what is this basically saying? Anybody want to break this down a little bit? What's the difference in a mortal sin and a venial sin? <laughs> okay, Michelle said, some sins are okay. Mm. That's one way to say it. What else? Say it again. Okay. So some, some would say, is there such thing as a white lie? That, that's one way. Is something, you know, you can look, but you can't touch. You know, where did that come from? You know, the, the idea of lust. That's not what Jesus was talking about. 
Jesus was, Jesus, I mean, you can look, but you can't touch, is a, a total, total departure from what Jesus was saying in the Sermon on the Mount. When he says, if you looked at a, a woman, it's showing the sin is in your heart. It's as if you've sinned, it's as if you've slept with her. You, you, you get angry with your brother, it's as if you murdered your brother. So um, we would say, oh, he just gets mad and he just yells at you and he just tells you off and a few things like that. And the picture is that you, you know, that's not a mortal sin. Um, that's not a sin that you're going to go to hell over um, versus a venial sin, which seems to be um, very, very small. So evangelical Protestantism, that's us, we would say no dual sin concept. That simply does not exist. Sins are sins. They do not, the word sin, you may want to make a note of this, sin means to miss the mark. It's like a term of archery, that it's anything less than a bullseye. And so it's to miss the target. It's to miss the mark. You're supposed to hit the mark and you don't miss it. You don't make the mark. Well, here is the picture is, is that we would say, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, Isaiah says, there is none righteous, no, not one. And so there's, there's this picture that all sin is what sets us uh, up, uh, at odds with the holiness of God. Put a big circle around the words on the sacraments. So here's another area. Here's another area in which we would differ with the Catholic Church. Catholicism would say, grace is, underline it, infused, grace is infused in the very act of the sacraments. The, it, and here are the sacraments that they would say, this is how you get God's grace. It's through baptism, baptism as an infant, con, con, or, or otherwise, if later you're becoming a Catholic later, but baptism uh, presumably as an, as an infant. Confirmation, the Eucharist. What's the Eucharist? The Lord's Supper or communion. We're going to be observing the Lord's Supper this Sunday at our church here at Sheridan Hills. So the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. Confession, the sacrament of confession, the con sacrament of anointing the sick, holy orders, and matrimony or marriage. We would say, no, God's grace is not given through all of these things. In fact, we would use the word sacrament a little bit differently, but we would say this, that grace is offered as the sacraments, as, as they are taken in faith. And write the word faith and then circle it, because this is a big deal. That in faith, that we are in faith connecting these two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, to the gospel of Christ. That it's through baptism and the Lord's Supper that we confess faith in Jesus Christ. And it's our confession of faith in Jesus Christ, our faith in him, that brings to us the salvation of God. That we do not deny him, that we embrace him, that we believe in him. And that it's not just our words, but it's our life is a confession of faith. So um, we receive um, his grace, certainly, um, as we confess him as Lord. So on baptism, we also did put a big circle around baptism. So those are the sacraments up there, but let's specifically look at baptism. Catholicism believes that baptism is the act through which the new birth occurs in the life of an infant. So an infant may be conceived in sin and born in sin, but when the infant is baptized, which should be as soon as possible, they would say, that that sin is broken and they are entered into the prevenient grace of God or into a saving, what would eventually become a saving grace of God, as we'll see. Look what it says. Born with a fallen human nature and tainted by original sin, which we would agree with, children also have need of the new birth in baptism to be freed from the power of darkness and brought into the realm of the freedom of the children of God to which all men are called. The sheer gratuitousness of the grace of salvation is, in, is particularly manifest in infant baptism. The church and the parents would deny a child the priceless, the priceless grace of becoming a child of God were they not to confirm baptism shortly after birth. So they're saying this is absolutely essential. You must baptize your children into the Catholic order in this way. And here's what they would say about that as well. 
All sins are forgiven, including original sin and personal sins, as well as punishment of sin um, through baptism. Look at the next part. And they are completed, this, this whole picture, baptism is completed at confirmation. So some of you would say, well, I was baptized as a, as a infant, but I never did confirmation. Well, they would say, mm, you go on to hell. <laughs> they would say, your baptism didn't work. And so confirmation would come at a later time. We have a confirmation book. This is Mrs. Hewlett's confirmation book, the Baltimore Catechism. Mrs. Hewlett grew up as a Catholic. Many of you heard her testimony at the Easter sunrise service. Uh, what was that, last year? Yes. Last year. How many of you heard Mrs. Hewlett's testimony? So she grew up as a Catholic at the, at the uh, uh, Lord's Supper, we, or excuse me, at the Easter sunrise service. We heard her testimony. And this is the book that she was taught the, the doctrines of the Catholic faith as part of her co confirmation. And it was one, this is one of the books that as she was reading this and she was hearing these things and comparing this with what the Bible said, she, by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, started to say, wait a minute, that's not true. That's not what the Bible says. And so that started to bring about a huge conflict in her heart over the fact that she started to see that that's not, in fact, what the Bible actually says. So these are some of the areas where we see that. But confirmation, that issue of confirmation, is where your salvation is complete, um, and in, as in, uh, in connection with your baptism. Now, evangelical Protestantism would say something very different. So let's see what we say as a, as a church. Baptism represents, circle the word, represents. Baptism represents the new birth that has occurred in the life of the believer. Represents is important. It symbolizes. You could also write the word symbolize above that. So that when Bill Loudon, when he became a Christian in his uh, early 20s, is that right? It was early 20s. Boy, that was like 45 years ago, right, Bill? No, just kidding. No. Bill Loudon, when he became a Christian in his early 20s here at Sheridan Hills, and he was baptized, what happened was Bill was laid down in the water, and then he was raised up. And the picture was that he is representing that as Christ was laid in the grave and rose again, and as he saved me upon me receiving him as my Lord and Savior, receiving the gospel, just as he saved me, Whenever that occurred, maybe it was the week before or the month before or five years before, whenever it was occurred, and he was baptized, he's saying, I am, I am now symbolizing Christ saving me from my sins. I'm a new creation in Christ. I've been brought to new life in Christ. I've been to the grave and I've been back. My, my sinful self is gone. It's not that he doesn't sin anymore. Ask him. She'll tell you all about it. He still sins, but he has been saved positionally by faith in Jesus. And this is part of the amazing thing. It proves that his salvation doesn't save him. If Bill were to die of a heart attack right now, I hope not, Lord, but if he were to die of a heart attack right now and he hadn't have a chance to confess his, his sins of today, in Jesus Christ, because his soul is secure in Jesus and he has confessed Christ and received Christ and is secure in him and he's become a child of God, Jesus is looking at him and saying, Bill, you're mine. You're always going to be mine. And this is one of the biggest, biggest pictures of God's grace, that even when we still sin against him, we're still saved. This is amazing, um, amazing grace. And baptism is a representation that the old bill is gone, the new bill is alive. It, he's not perfect yet. He'll be perfect when he is finally given a new body and he's given a new life in heaven. That's when it will all be finished. But um, his sin debt is finished now. Jesus has paid it all. So um, notice here with me, not only baptism, but also the Eucharist or communion. Now, here's a big word for you to fill in there. Here's the big difference is they believe in something called transubstantiation. Now, I know it's 7.50 p.m., and you're wondering, how do I spell transubstantiation? <laughs> I got up uh, 14 hours ago, 15 hours ago. I'm tired. Trans, sub, stant, eation. So you, you sound it out, but it's also at the bottom of the paragraph that's here. So you can see that if you need to cheat. Um, but transubstantiation is what they believe. What in the world is transubstantiation? 
this is important for us to see, and it's not just a minor issue. It's a major issue because it has to do with twisting Scripture and not recognizing what really um, the Lord's Supper actually means. But look at page 71 there in that paragraph. Because Christ our Redeemer said that it was truly his body that was offering under the species of bread, it has always been the conviction of the church of God, and this holy council now declares again that by the consecration of the bread and the wine, there takes a place, there takes, excuse me, there takes place a change, underline that, a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ, our Lord, and of the whole substance of the what? Wine into the substance of his blood. This change the Holy Catholic Church has fittingly and properly called transubstantiation. The only problem with that is there is no scriptural evidence for that in the New Testament. And there's reasons that they came up with this doctrine in control over the Lord's Supper, in control over this picture. And there's various aspects of which they would say that they are trying to literally force things that Jesus said or that the Apostle Paul said upon our thinking. They're trying to make it a literal interpretation when Christ was saying, no, the spiritual interpretation is so much more important. You see, when we talk about consuming Christ, we're not talking about being cannibals and eating the body of Christ. We're saying this, that when Andrew Coleman sins, I am consuming, Christ died on the cross for my sins. And my sin is why Christ was consumed unto death. Does that make sense? He gave himself up to be consumed like a sacrifice offering on the altar of the Old Testament that you would put the goat or you would put the sheep or the bull on there on the fire and it would be consumed by the fire. It would be completely destroyed. And so the picture is, is that when I am sinning against God, it's my sin that consumes the body of Christ. And so the picture of baptism, excuse me, the picture of the Lord's Supper is to be that we would see that as we take the bread and Jesus said, this is my body that is broken for you, do this what? Remember. It's about remembering. It's a symbol. It's not the actual thing. It's not, we're, he's already died for our sins on the cross. We are called to remember it, not re-crucify him and not reconsume him. Does that make sense? Yes. And so this is the picture that, that what, part of what their misunderstanding is in their wrong theology is in order to keep getting saved, you have to keep coming back. You have to keep coming back to this, this way of grace in order to keep being saved. And if you were to stop this, you could lose your salvation. In fact, Catholics do not believe in the security of the believer. Catholics do not believe that anyone can know that they're saved. In fact, if you ask most Catholics, so when you die, can you tell me, you know, what, are you going to go to heaven? And they will say, well, I hope so. I really hope so, but I can't be sure. Because there are, there are very, very many open gaps in Catholic theology that says it's never a sure thing. Now, that, that's a great travesty. And, and listen to this. Here, here's part of the problem with this. How many of you that have had children look at your children and you want them to wonder whether you love them? Do any of you want them to wonder whether you love them? No. You tell them, I love you a thousand times. You, you tell them, I love you over and over. They get sick of hearing it. They're like, yeah, 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 I know. And I mean, you, you're sitting there and, and you, you understand that you, you have this great desire for the, Let me tell you that God with his children who Christ has bought, he does not want you to wonder if he loves you. You may get a spanking from him. He may chastise you in loving you. But that's not to make you wonder if he loves you. That's to help you love him more and to come to know who he is. So um, there's a whole lot there as well, but it's, it's not about constantly seeking to reaffirm your salvation through that. Um, what about confession? 
Put a big circle around the word confession, on confession. So this is another one. They would say, on page 72, um, they would, Catholicism would say, confession reconciles one with God. And notice their statement here. The whole power of the sacrament of penance consists in restoring us to God's grace and joining us with him in an intimate friendship. Reconciliation with God is thus the purpose and effect of this sacrament. For those who receive the sacrament of penance with contrite heart and religious disposition, reconciliation is usually followed by peace and serenity of conscience with strong spiritual consolation. Indeed, the sacrament of reconciliation with God brings about a true spiritual resurrection, restoration of the dignity and the blessings of the life of the children of God, of which the most precious is friendship with God. Now, I would say this. Confession to the Lord Jesus Christ can certainly have some of these emotional effects in this nearness to God. When I confess my sin to God and I agree with Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 where I say, my, I confess my sin to the Lord, I did not hide my iniquity to him. And he came and he forgave the guilt of my sin and he comes and he delivers me from this in this. This is, this is the beautiful picture of my friendship with God being... But let me tell you that I don't have to go to a priest for that because Jesus is my high priest. Jesus is the one who died. I, in fact, the thing that is my priest is my faith in Jesus. I, we believe as Baptists in the priesthood of every believer. It's a very important doctrine that's very clear in Scripture that you can come to God because of what Jesus did. And so how do you come to God? You come to God by faith. It's not that you have to go to a man of faith. You can be a man of faith. You can be a woman of faith and experience the reconciliation with God as he would intend. A sinner confesses, so they would say a sinner confesses mortal sins to a priest. So that you only confess things you're going to go hell over. In fact, some of you have heard a priest look at you and say, why are you confessing that? You don't need to confess that to me. Why would he say that? That's a venial sin. I don't have time to hear all your venial sins. Only confess to me your mortal sins. I mean, that's, that's part of the picture that is there. And very, okay, say three Hail Marys, do this, and go buy a bread, a loaf, a loaf of bread for the guy at the corner, and your sins will be forgiven you. So there, there comes this statement of penitence um, and this statement of of paying it off, working it off through this, again, uh, a gross misunderstanding of what the Scripture teaches. Notice the next part. A priest imposes acts of penance and offers forgiveness of sins. Notice what it says here in this statement. Since Christ entrusted to his apostles the ministry of reconciliation, and now they're, they're misunderstanding a passage from Romans, um, bishops, who are their successors, priests, and bishops, collaborators, continue to exercise this ministry. Indeed, bishops and priests, by virtue of the sacrament of holy orders, have the power to forgive all sins. <laughs> wow. <sighs> Y'all, that's serious. That's a serious error. There is only one who has the power to forgive sins. And that is the one who paid for the sins. He's the only one who can forgive sins. And look at you and say you're forgiven. And it's simply because. It's gloriously because he paid for them. Um, we need to recognize that we believe in, and here it is, the priesthood of the believer. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 4 in verse 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who, is, who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Right, right below that, Jesus. That's who it's talking about. Who is our high priest? Our high priest is Jesus. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. This is so beautiful. You can confidently come before God. That we may find, that we may receive mercy and find grace in help of need, in time of need. 
Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 are two wonderful verses for you to memorize. Especially if you keep having a problem with sin, you keep going back and wondering, is God forgive me? Is God forgive me? Is God for me? I, I want to encourage you to memorize these passages. You know, the way you, you fix your wrong thinking is by filling it with right thinking, and God's Word is what does that. Okay, you know what? We're going to stop there tonight. Um, we, we are going to stop there because it's already 8 o'clock, and we are less than halfway through. Um, and I don't want to be in trouble with the children's workers because they will come shoot me. Um, God may forgive, but they don't. Um, so, just kidding. Um, now, let me take a moment to just, to just say to you, um, it is right that we carefully look at what the Scripture says and what the Scripture doesn't say concerning our, our beliefs and, and our truths um, that, that we are seeking to live by. Um, as, we, as we continue to say, Lord, what do you have for us? I, I just want to say to you tonight that um, our only hope is in Christ. What we sang tonight, in Christ alone, I put my trust in Christ alone. He is the one that is my foundation. He is the one that is my salvation. Do you remember Sunday morning when we were studying in Hosea and we, we quoted a passage from Ezekiel and the passage from Ezekiel is called, The Lord is our righteousness. His name is our righteousness. You see, that's who he is. Um, that's who he is to us. The hope that we have is his righteousness. And he gives, as we're going to see next week, he gives his righteousness to us. And this is a vast difference between trying to work for our salvation, trying to be moralistic and uh, good for it um, in all of these different ways.